Welcome to Scratch Building 101. You've built a few kits, so what's next? I'm Paul, VK3HN, and I'm going to take you through some things that I've learned about scratch building over the last five or so years. So scratch building, what is it? Why do it? And how do you do it? Well, let me just take a minute to give you a little bit of background on me. I was born in 1960. I cut my teeth on transistor projects and uh, built many crystal sets, simple radios and other simple projects uh, right through the 70s. I had various call signs, picked up VK3HN in 2002 and then uh, had a period of inactivity returning to the hobby about six years ago. By this time, SOTA had really gained a lot of momentum in VK3, and I thought this was a terrific opportunity to a few of the things that I love, and that's walking and hiking in the Australian bush with making and playing with radios. So what is scratch building? Well, I think of scratch building as building a working thing from bare parts or assemblies. It's following your own desires and designs. It's continuously prototyping because everything that you scratch build is always a one-off. What's the difference between kit building and scratch building? Well, when you kit build, you're making up someone else's proven design. So there's a very high chance of power up success. And that's a really good thing. There is usually extensive and responsive help available, but usually limited variation in how you can configure or change the kit that you're building. Scratch building, on the other hand, is making up your own design or designs that you've sourced from a number of places. So you're going to have to come up with the design, uh, come up with the construction. So problems are guaranteed. There'll be limited help, but there will be unlimited design freedom. Let me take a minute to show you some of my scratch built QRP rigs and then you'll have a better idea of where I'm coming from. So around about 2015, this was my entry back into home brewing and scratch building. Summit Prowler 1. So this was a 40 meter sideband transceiver by local homebrew legend Drew Diamond VK3XU. Almost nothing worked as I built this project. Many of the boards had to be rebuilt from scratch. This was where I relearned how to homebrew and learned a number of new things as well. I built some more projects and by the time I got to my fourth homebrew project, now 2017, I decided that I would modify a design by Leon VK2DOB, his minimal sideband transceiver. So by now I was using Arduinos and SI5351s, and I modified Leon's design to cover six bands. So this transceiver worked very well, and it was really my most successful attempt at coming up with a portable QRP transceiver. <laughs> And you are 5-9 to me. Yes, you sort of 5-9, Gary. I'll take that. And, uh, yeah, very good uh, clean signal coming in uh, from Mundara State Park at uh, 5 a.m. Around about this time, I discovered the work of Peter, DK7 India Hotel. I tried to reproduce one of his designs, and SP6 was the result. Four bands, again, five watts. And you can see in the inset there that it is very packed in. This was really an exercise in compact building. A year or two later again, so now we're into 2020, coronavirus time. Um, I'm up to homebrew transceiver project number eight, so SP8. This time I wanted to build a... 10 meter, 28 megahertz SSB transceiver. Here it is, it's quite a compact rig. But to give it extra versatility, I built a 10 meter to two meter transverter into the same box. So it's a commercial transverter by UR3LMZ. Um, they're freely available on eBay and other sources. So with the flick of the switch, this rig does 
10 metres SSB or 2 metres SSB. And over the coronavirus period, when I haven't had the option to go to soda summits or further afield, I've had a lot of fun operating from local hilltops with SP8. And then finally, SP9. This is another compact five-band SSB CW transceiver. It really doesn't do anything more than the earlier designs do. However, I paid more careful attention to a number of the aspects of the design and the construction. So it was really my opportunity to build another SSB multi-band transceiver and just do it better. Okay, so how do you tackle these projects? Here are, here are three C's which might help you think about how to take a more complex project such as a scratch-built SSB CW transceiver and break it down into achievable parts, concept, choices and construction. I try to start with the concept. What is this thing that I'm going to make? So what's the essence of the design? So I often try and think of a well-known example and I try and think of what would success be like if I can realise this concept with a homebrew project. So the story here is that several years ago I went on a SOTA weekend and pictured is Glenn VK3YY using his KX2 and I was just very impressed by the way he was able to put on this, the shortened centre-loaded antenna and effortlessly work VK and ZLs on 20 metres using his KX2. And it just left this germ of an idea in my mind. I wonder if I could come up with a handheld walkie-talkie styled transceiver that would allow me to do something similar. And the transceiver that I built on the bottom right is what I came up with, it's SP5. So it does 20 and 40 metres, five watts of CW and SSB. And there I am on a soda summit top right, using SP5 to, uh, to activate the summit. So obviously, my little transceiver here is uh, not a patch on the KX2, but all I was trying to do was to reproduce the concept of a handheld on 20 and 40 metres on a summit. Once you've got the concept right, so what this project is going to be, you're faced with a bit of a barrage of choices. So physical dimensions, features, controls, how you'll arrange the controls to make the user experience, what acceptable performance might be, and the amount of commitment and effort that you're going to have to put in to pull this project off. There are lots of choices to be made and choices always involve compromise. So just think about the transceiver complexity. So do I really need a superhead or do I need to go beyond a superhead, perhaps to a quadrature or um, hybrid SDR type arrangement? Or can I, could I even get by with a direct conversion receiver? If I go with a superhead, then what's the best architecture? Is it bi-directional like the BIDX or separate receive and transmit signal paths? What receiver mixer and product detector am I going to use? These are critical choices in the performance of the receiver. So um, Gilbert cells or diode ring mixers or perhaps a switching mixer. What will my IF be and how will I, what will I do about the filter? So build my own, repurpose an old one, even perhaps purchase a new one. VFO, BFO, AGC, audio filtering. Do I even need AGC? or audio filtering, and what kind of devices am I going to need to realise this uh, concept? So MOSFETs, JFETs, um, other discretes, or um, integrated circuits, etc. Of course, a key input and a choice that involves compromising is the modes. So will it be CW only, which results in a very significant simplification? Do I need it to do sideband as well? 
um, or maybe some additional modes. Even something as simple as the display involves a whole bunch of choices and often compromises. There's a display that I might like to use, but what's going to be involved in interfacing to it? Is it big enough? Is, uh, is the readability su suitable for, uh, for outdoor use? How much current will it draw? Can I mount it? Will it be rugged enough? Is it going to be a source of RF noise? And if I blow one of the two of them up, can I replace it easily? And of course, power levels. So transmitter power, even the audio power from the receiver, the overall power budget. So um, how big a battery am I prepared to, uh, to, to need to lug around to run this rig? Of course, what bands will it cover and what will the frequency coverage be? So my transceiver projects are nearly all multi-band because I need multiple bands to ensure that I can guarantee to get those four contacts on a summit. But if that's not a key consideration for you, then you might well um, get by with a monoband transceiver or project. That gets you to the third C, construction. How are you going to make the case? How are you going to make the printed circuit boards? And what techniques are you going to use for soldering, cutting, bonding, fixing, maintaining and doing labels and finishes. So I've settled on a method of construction and PCBs that suits me, but there are any number of ways that you can do your case and build your printed circuit boards. So concept choices with inevitable compromises and construction. You start to go around a cycle. And as I'm doing this, I'm spending a lot of time looking at designs on the internet, looking at the classic textbooks, looking at my great pile, my filing cabinet full of sketches and notes, and, uh, and just going around the circle and doing a lot of sketches of my own as the backdrop to this slide illustrates. But all of these elements interchange or interplay. So I might find that I make choices for the transceiver architecture, which imply a lot about the construction. Or maybe I'll get to the point where the choices that I've made and the compromises that I've accepted and the construction approach that, that I've sketched for myself on paper, maybe I look at it and I think, this is just not going to work. And so I kind of abandon that concept. Of course, you're going to go around this loop many times. You're going to cycle around and around. And over time, you start to get comfortable with choices and then the field narrows. This is what Pete Giuliano refers to as noodling. So here's the PCB method that I've used for a long time. Very old school. I sketch out the board to scale. I trace around the components that I'm going to place on the board. And then I roughly draw up the copper traces. I translate that design onto the copper board and I'm using permanent markers of a variety of sizes um, from very fine to quite broad. Uh, once that's done, I then put the board through a ferric chloride bath and then of course clean it up and um, either tin it or spray it with uh, clear enamel. This is a process that I've been using for probably 40 years and I'm completely comfortable with it. It is very labour intensive does require a lot of hand drawing, but there are any number of ways that you can do boards and it's just a matter of finding a way that suits your style of building. Here's my board coming together into a module. So the two printed circuit boards there with a few of the components just sitting over the top. Now I've tinned the boards and I've put the boards together. They're held together with 0.1 inch um, headers. The Arduino Nano is uh, socketed on the top board. Now the SI5351 breakout is um, sandwiched there between the bottom and the, the middle board and uh, most of the components are on. I'm trying increasingly to put the panel mounted socket, so DC jack there and a headphone jack or an external speaker jack and a key press button. I'm trying increasingly to, uh, to solder those directly to the board to avoid all the extra work of uh, flying leads. And the other advantage of doing that is that the whole unit comes together as a module, so a physical assembly, electronics, connectors, you can hold it in the palm of your hand. So here I put a fake front panel on. This will sit smugly behind the aluminium front panel um, with front panel controls. And, and, and this is now completed. It, it was completely tested. And, uh, and once I've verified that all of the functions work, 
the, pu the push buttons, the controls, um, the various signals coming off the back of it. Um, I can put this module aside and move on with the next. And then it's just a matter of mounting and assembling your tested modules into the case as your case comes together, constantly checking back against your sketches and your plans because very simple things can, can cause a jam and can cause your module to perhaps no longer fit. But of course, eventually something won't fit and then you just have to rebuild some part of your project. Let's talk about the tools that I think are unnecessary. You really don't need anything particularly sophisticated to begin scratch building projects like these. So I started with the tools across the top half of this slide. Um, the only ones that I really need to point out, I think, because they may not be self-evident. One of them is a digital LC meter. It's essential that you're able to measure the inductance of your toroids. You can add or subtract turns or, or compress or expand turns and get your inductors spot on. Variable voltage, variable current power supply I have found to be essential because you often want to start modules down on five or six volts and then wind them up to 12 to 15 volts uh, once you know that they are working, particularly with gain stages and amplifiers. And you also need current limiting. If you're going to build power stages, you want to be able to current limit those at you know 100 milliamps or 400 milliamps until such time as you've got the bias set correctly. And just having a current limited supply will pick up shorts and so forth without doing damage. There are two tools that I've included over on the right hand side that really take you a very long way. The FRG7 there, a communications receiver. With a general 0 to 30 megahertz communications receiver, you can still do an awful lot. You can check your oscillators, you can, um, and you can monitor signal strength. I think a very underrated and um, timeless uh, piece of test gear, the general coverage receiver on the bench next to your projects. The modern equivalent is, of course, web SDRs. As soon as you've got even as little as 100 milliwatts of output from one of your transmitters or one of your modules, um, you can put it on an antenna and it's very likely that you'll see it on a nearby or even an interstate SDR. Then you can check its frequency accuracy and you can do some signal quality monitoring. As long as, of course, you observe the conventions of your license and the band. So identify and, and you know, just be careful about where you're dropping carriers or signals. The middle line here are some tools that I suggest you can add after a while. But really the VNA or the Scalar Network Analyzer is an essential tool for for any work that you do with crystal filters or bandpass filters. You can get bandpass filters tuned up um, without one. Being able to sweep them makes a huge difference. I built my first couple of rigs without a modern digital storage oscilloscope, but when I got a bit more serious and um, threw out my old analog scope and bought a new digital one, it was like turning the room lights on to be able to see input waveforms and output waveforms and to be able to trace signals right through. An RF signal and function generator is probably almost essential, but you can get it by with the output of your VFOs or um, just, just standalone crystal oscillators will take you quite a long way. And then when you win the lotto, um, you can buy that spectrum analyzer or that microscope and you can set up your workshop. Here are some things I've learned. Use trustworthy sources. There are an awful lot of schematics and uh, projects on the web. Not all of them work, but I've had a lot more success in getting things to work when I've taken the schematics and taken the designs from some of these kinds of trustworthy sources. It's been important to keep accurate schematics and notes. So for a long time, I was keeping my schematics just on uh, hand-drawn uh, A4 pages, and that's great. Um, more recently, I've gone to KeyCAD because it allows me to build, uh, build up these schematics and then publish them on my blog so people don't have to ask me for the schematics. They can look at them themselves, and that just value-adds the blog. The important point here is that when you change something, be disciplined and go back and make that change. Mark that change up on your schematic. 
So even if it's just one capacitor or one resistor, make sure you go back and update your schematic because sooner or later, you're gonna do some maintenance on that project or you might pull it out because you wanna build another one of those bandpass filters or another one of those RF amplifiers and you really want the values to be correct when you do that. Building in modules, I think I've probably already suggested this, building and testing in modules is really the only way that I think I've been able to make progress on some of these transceiver projects. And testing the modules is absolutely essential. Here, testing a small QRP driver PA. So just a crystal oscillator to as, as drive and uh, looking at the output signal there as it, as it warms up a dummy load. Uh, you actually learn uh, a huge amount about the, the module, the circuit that you're building once it's in test. And uh, that's when you really get to prove out its performance. Of course, once a module has been thoroughly tested and you're happy with it, you've got confidence then that you can build it into your chassis and it will almost certainly work or at least not cause you problems. Here are two other modules. The one on the left is a complete physical and electronic um, VFO controller module. That's from my SP6 project. The one on the right, uh, the five band, four pole band pass filters from SP9. Again, completely built uh, in isolation. Each of those band pass filters for the five bands was independently swept and aligned. I was able to verify that the bandpass filters worked properly in transmit and receive. The module can then be bolted into the chassis and I know that it's going to work. Some other things that I've learned, operate where and when it suits you. So for me, it's out in the open, on soda summits, in parks. Um, really one of the most enjoyable things that I've come to love in recent years. It gets me out into the great Australian bush and onto a Australian mountaintops. The projects don't even have to be finished and all of those long walks give me plenty of time to be uh, noodling over improvements and the next project. And it can be a great social activity as well. Now, there will be problems when you're scratch building. There are many things that can go wrong and before long all of these things um, stand a fair chance of cropping up. Shorts, opens, missing components uh, and intermittent connections, insufficient gain or too much gain, so incorrect gain distribution, oscillation, of course, noise, transmitter RF feedback, oscillator spurii and spots, physical casing problems and just layout problems. I've listed the uh, remediations and the things that you can do to address these problems down the right-hand side. They're all very well-known techniques and approaches and you really just get a feel for what is likely to work. And if you're testing your modules in, uh, in isolation, it becomes very much easier to diagnose and to solve many of these problems. I want to leave you with three suggestions for scratch built modules that you might like to build. So starter number one, an Arduino and SI5351 VFO controller. Just really, it's just a nano and an SI5351 breakout, maybe a few voltage regulators and a handful of components. This is a very, really a very simple project. You can use my script or any one of the many scripts that are available. It should not take too long to build and you're guaranteed to learn a lot. Another is to experiment with a scratch built RF power amp. So maybe an IRF 510. Any number of uh, readily available transistors can act as drivers and you can drive it from a signal generator or a crystal, crystal oscillator. Um, you don't have to build the low pass filters, you can just uh, knock this up on a very simple board. And there are all sorts of things that you'll learn about simple single ended RF power amps by building one up and experimenting with it. And finally, you could think about building a superhet IF strip. There are really two components to this module. Uh, one is the crystal filter, which could be uh, a simple homebrew ladder filter, or you might have a crystal filter lying around that perhaps a ham fest find or one pulled from an old boat anchor, or you could build or you could buy one. The amplifier stage, there are any number of ways of building this uh, two stage or a three stage IF amplifier. The thing about your high F strip is it will have a gain of 50 to 70 dB. So it's guaranteed to oscillate. So this will be an exercise in taming the beast. So to conclude, 
There are videos for most of my projects on my YouTube channel, or you can read about them and also see videos on my blog. All of my schematics are on my blog and my firmware is on GitHub. Thank you for staying and listening to my story about scratch building. Hopefully it might have inspired you to scratch build something of your own.